Greetings and salutations, my minions. Kunik here, back with two RPG horror stories for you today. And quite the tales they are with two that guys that take some liberties with the, uh, the rules to uh, do some uh, that guy things. I won't say any more, so with that all said, let's roll for initiative and begin the stories. Story number one, Fantasy Groundhog Day. This was back in 2019, the before times, and I had been invited to join a new group by some in real life friends. The GM wanted to run a text-based 5th edition game, which everyone agreed to as most of the group had unreliable internet due to living situations. I don't particularly enjoy text-based games, but I was excited to play with good in real life friends and people I already knew. The adventure was posed as a murder mystery, with a bit of bodyguarding thrown in for good measure. Our task was to go to a spooky mansion, investigate a murder, and prevent the murderer from getting the next guy. Simple enough. We all rolled up characters that we thought would work with the brief. Some nerdy investigator types and a couple of burly bodyguards. All in all, it was a fun cast of characters. After a short bit of searching for clues, the trouble started. Charged with protecting an NPC, who we shall call the Brat, because he was seriously a bratty kid, from a hidden murderer. The party decided to move to a more secure location. We didn't get far. Within five minutes, we encountered the first of many deadly traps in this adventure. Without warning, and without much chance to react, the Brat was dead. However, in a sudden twist, our sadness at failure became joy. The party opened to their eyes and were stood exactly where we started our adventure, just moments before our investigation began. Every time the brat died, we'd loop back to the beginning. Hey, that's cool, we thought. We were wrong. What ensued was a seemingly endless cycle of failure, often with no chance of overcoming any obstacles. The GM was open about his intent. Everything we faced was too deadly for us to actually overcome. So, we just had to keep notes of where we had been in each time loop and, well, not go there. That seemed easy enough and was, on paper, a pretty cool idea for a game. However, we had a pursuer. Our murderer turned out to be a supernatural monster, which followed us wherever we went in every time loop. It would turn up wherever we went, at any point in any time loop, insta-kill the brat, forcing us back to the beginning of the loop, Phase through walls. Stretch its limbs. Longest melee attack I can remember was 60 feet. Regenerate so fast that nobody in our level 4 party could harm it. I'll save some space here. If you could imagine some kind of ridiculously overpowered ability, I'd guess that it could do it. This monster existed for no reason but to turn up whenever the GM wanted, meaning that even when we were succeeding at avoiding the previously encountered dangers, we were doomed to loop whenever he felt like it. For the next eight months, we looped and looped and looped and looped and looped and looped and... Yeah, you get the idea. The mansion was our in-game prison. While the game itself became a prison for its players, there was no escaping the fantasy Groundhog Day. Frustrations were H-I-G-H -H high, and bad behavior from players started to become the norm. Playing via text was slow and the constant looping was disheartening, and game disputes would often end with PvP, egged on by the GM, with one player, let's call him Mr. PvP, outright attacking PCs over small disagreements. My own character was a victim to this twice, being left for dead on both occasions. I snapped. This game was not fun. I, admittedly rudely, asked the GM out of game what he wanted from us. I accused him of wasting our time and practically begged him to stop encouraging Mr. PvP to attack other players. After he refused, I told him I quit. He begged me to stay and promised that everything would make sense soon and that we were almost finished. I caved and carried on playing. Outside of the game, several of us players had also started having real-life arguments over how people were acting during game. Personally, I ended up having a serious in-real-life fallout with Mr. PvP, and flat-out thought, this guy is a bad person. All the while, the GM sat back and watched it happen, over and over again. 
Eventually, the adventure came to a very unceremonious close, where the GM solved his own mystery with a lengthy cutscene, with next to no input from the PCs. I have since quit the group, but stayed in touch with most of the people, including the GM. Fast forward to a recent conversation that spurred my decision to write this post. Now, in 2021, he revealed the big secret of this adventure to both myself and another ex-group member. Mr. PvP's character was working for the enemy the whole time. Every time he attacked the party, every time he disagreed so strongly with plans that we changed path, every time he caused any problems, it was because the GM had told him to do it. And by his own admission, on top of everything else, we were never supposed to find out about this, and Mr. PvP didn't want to do it. Duck you, GM. Dormammu, I've come to bargain. And this whole Mr. PvP backstabbing thing actually kind of hits home for me, because I'm planning my very first DM session out there, and I'm kind of working this into the story, so maybe I'm going to sit back and, and not have a player backstab the other players. We'll see. <laughs> but in this case, things went a little too far. Obviously, a relationship was ruined over the whole Mr. PvP thing, and... The fact that it came to light that he didn't even want to do what he did in the end, and a friendship was ruined as a result of it, is tragic. Hopefully they're able to make amends and become friends again, because that's kind of stupid. But yeah, it's very clear that the DM in this case was the that guy. He had a story that he wanted to have told and used a campaign to do it. He wanted it to end a very specific way and did not want the players to have any input to that. Which to me is a huge no-no. Even if you want the story to go a specific way, write a few alternatives that you'd be happy with in case the players do something entirely out of left field that you weren't expecting. That way, you're still okay with it. It's maybe not the ideal situation that you were going to go down, but it is something that you still thought up and can plan for. Just my two cents there for the DM. Really, when things started to go as far as they went and friendships were you know, ending and people were wanting to quit, etc., DM at that point in time should have definitely stepped in and sort of laid down the laws to what was happening, just to prevent a fallout of the friendships that ultimately happened. Anyhow, onwards to story number two. A superhero campaign is ruined by a that guy. So, back in the dark ages of mid to late 2020, I was running a Masks play-by-post game. That game collapsed, and looking back, I'm glad it did. It taught me a valuable lesson about vetting your players. The problems presented themselves first with a player who I'll call Saiyan. Saiyan had joined up a little bit later than the rest of the group. After two party members had ghosted, at the behest of a player who said that one of his friends wanted to join up. They wanted to play the Outsider Playbook slash Class, which is inspired by characters like Starfire from Teen Titans, or Miss Martian from Young Justice, aliens from another world who came to Earth, and have to adjust their cultural context. That kind of vibe. So, Saiyan decided to make their character a Saiyan, hence the name. Yes, explicitly the kind from Dragon Ball Z. Even though their character was clearly very heavily inspired by Dragon Ball Z, I saw some ways they could fit into the player's group of teen superhero reality stars, well into their first adventure, and mesh their concept into the story as it was unfolding. Problem number one came when Saiyan completely did not even consider any suggestions that I had made to help explain why they would be able to hop in and help the party. Instead, in the middle of another story moment, they introduced themselves into the scene with no context at what was meant to be an exclusive event, and then started beating up the same supervillain the party was. That leads me to problem number two, the in-character language barrier. Masks is a system all about team superheroes, yeah, but what it was specifically about is teen superhero drama, mama. Miscommunications are par for the course. But they're more about being a stupid teenager than legitimately not being able to communicate basic words and concepts to the people you're meant to be playing a game with. Saiyan did not have their character communicate in an intelligible way. Typing gibberish and then insisting that there was nobody around not even the party's nomad, who already knew lots of alien languages because of their backstory, could translate it. That bit overstayed its welcome quickly, as it basically amounted to their character spouting gibberish, and doing something entirely counterproductive to the rest of the team's goals, causing chaos. 
It wasn't like having an extra player, it was like having to GM around an NPC with a mind of their own. There is a reason why the inspirations behind the Outsider playbook explicitly had ways to quickly learn how to communicate with humans. Because if you can't communicate with somebody on at least one level, how the hell are you supposed to be a superhero team with them? Even in Dragon Ball Z, Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa could communicate with the main characters with zero effort. It would not have been nearly as frustrating to have to deal with as a GM if they would have explained what their character's thought process were out of character, or translated their gibberish so I knew what their intent and context was. But I was left with nothing, and they refused to do that. But even after those two problems, I thought that I could still salvage the game and not have to kick anybody out. I just needed to do a bit of a time skip to be able to explain how this alien who didn't know any English whatsoever would be made a primary cast member in a reality show headed up by the literal Greek muses. If I just gave them a translator of some kind, they wouldn't do that kind of thing again. It seemed like what San was doing was not out of malice, but out of ignorance. So I figured I'd just reestablish the expectations when we got another player to fully replace the two that had left. And I did. Basically, we'd go from Season 1 to Season 2 to explain the changing cast. I even let Saiyan invite one of their friends to be part of the game, thinking that they would fix themselves after that first impression. I was very wrong. That's when Problem 3 reared its ugly head. It turns out that Saiyan was preoccupied with SJWs and feminazis in the media, pushing their agenda onto fictional properties. And, for that matter, it turns out that the player who invited them and the player they brought in either agreed or were willing to play devil's advocate for them. I know I touched on this bit before, but for the record, the full main premise of this campaign was that the Greek muses reincarnated as the children of the setting's most famous black golden age superhero created a reality show to allow super teens of all kinds especially from marginalized groups, to be able to benefit from the platform that they had when they were kids. This was not a secret. This was in the listing that you had to read to join the game. In the full campaign setting write-up, I also described about how their band broke up back in the 1990s, at least partially because of homophobic media backlash that came about when the Muses was outed as bisexual and revealed to be dating a supervillain's daughter and the homophobes were not portrayed in any sort of sympathetic light. If that isn't a big red flag that I don't embrace reactionary anti-SJW politics, then I don't know what could be more clear. Do I need to staple a progress pride flag to my forehead or something? It was now clear to me why Saiyan didn't want to engage with the other players or NPCs or the world around their character. They just didn't get any of the actual implications or themes behind it. And most there was, most likely nothing that I could say to make them understand. Saiyan made this abundantly clear by acting like a hateful clown towards another player when they called Saiyan out on their bad takes. Because that player happened to have a trans flag in their profile picture. At that point, I decided that I did not want to run a game for Saiyan or anybody they happened to be acquainted with anymore, and pulled the plug. So, moral of the story, do not tolerate that guyish behavior. If you see the warning signs, nip them in the bud, or it will suck all of the fun right out of your game. Also, I've learned not to play RPGs with random people on the internet without making it explicitly clear that you have no tolerance for people knowingly being bigoted. In post. Yeah, I feel like what OP said at the end here, if they had just followed those rules at the very start, would have prevented this entire situation. They very clearly had an LGBTQ plus safe game, and these players were very much not interested in that. Had they read the description, they would have seen that that's exactly what the game was, but they didn't. And then the OP didn't vet them before they even joined. So really nothing more needs to be said than vet your players, especially if you're doing something on Roll20. You need to know what they're like and what they have as expectations from the game. Because sad as it is to say, there are a lot of bigoted people on the internet. And if you are running a game like this, you need to make sure that you don't allow any of them into the game, because it could very well ruin it. 
Now, unfortunately, I don't know if this game is still going on. I would hope that they only kicked the three problem people and were able to backfill those positions pretty quickly, but you never know. And unfortunately, as far as I can tell, there's not an update, but it sounds like a fun campaign. So hopefully things are still going. Anyhow, that's it for today's stories. As always, the source of them is in the description below. And if you like the video and you want to see more videos just like this one, be sure to hit that subscribe button and bell notification icon to be notified of my future videos. And while you wait for those future videos, here are a few related videos that you can watch in the meantime.